So Feast on the Word is the series that we are in at the moment, um, and I'll be looking today a little bit about what a feast in the Keo household is about. Keo household is my household with my husband. Um, so first of all, we're going to have a look at a few photos. My husband is very good at cooking. It's his love language, his creative outlet, and I think his best talent. So the top picture there is a porchetta. The bottom picture is a fig carpaccio. Next one on the left, we have a uh, Peking duck. What did you say it was before? <laughs> Barn owl. Okay. <laughs> no, it's a very nice Peking duck, which if anyone knows anything about Peking duck, that does about three courses. But anyways, that was his fun for that day. The one on the right does look like a bit of a dead roadkill, but it's actually marinated um, quail, butterfly, deboned. And oh, can you get back to that one? Because I need to point out the stuffed zucchini flowers underneath. Woof. Yeah. Uh, then the next one. Yes, thanks. Um, so the left is a... Um, piece of fish wrapped in prosciutto, and the one on the right is scallops on a pea puree with spinach. The next one is the best one, chicharrone, if anyone knows anything about chicharrone. Very yum pork crackling done in a South American style. It is so good. So yes, this is my husband's great <laughs> Um Now, I'll just tell you a little bit of a story about one day I had some friends I wanted to invite around for a dinner, just a dinner. And I said, Chris, would you mind just cooking some food for our friends as they come around? And he's like, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll think about it, get back to you. I'm expecting, okay, first course, we'll just do a quick little salad. Second course, we'll do mm, something to do with meat. And the third course, uh, dessert, ice cream, probably out of the, the, um, the freezer. Well, his idea of a nice dinner, we've got a five course degustation with matching wines. Get that, get that. Now. As I said, I think that is his, his love language. Mine? <laughs> I'm the opposite. I'm known for jumping in to help and then causing disaster. And actually, I do have a scar on here if anyone wants to come and have a look at me trying to cut pumpkin. Doesn't work in my, in my abilities. Um, so my first story is about a noodle story of me jumping in trying to help. Again, my lovely husband cooking something wonderful. I said, can I please help with anything? He says, yes, yes, you can cook the noodles. That's where my extent of abilities goes. Now, this is Asian noodles, so all we, we know, all we need to do is boil the kettle, get the, uh, the noodles out of the packet into a bowl, and then pour the boiling water over the top. That's my abilities. So Chris is busy cooking away, cooking up a storm. I can't remember exactly what the meal was. Then he starts to boil the jug, and I'm like, oh, oh, this is my job. This is where I get to jump in. So the, the water's boiled straight away. I put the water on the, the noodles. And he looks at me and said, what are you doing? Well, I'm doing the noodles. He said, no, no, I was just pre-boiling the jug so that when it was time to actually boil the jug, it wasn't going to take as long to boil. Good, good on you, Natalie. Yep. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Chase. Good on me. <laughs> Another great disaster of mine. Um, we were uh, at the time doing some video work for um, a magazine, and there was lots of editing that had to happen, and that was his ability again. So I said, look, look, look. I'll take this off your shoulders. How about you just go into the office and do the hours of editing that it takes. I'll go into the kitchen and make us a dinner. So I thought, yep, cool, I can do a bit of turkey, mashed potatoes, veggies. That can't be too hard, can it? No, nah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was just little turkey pieces, so nice and easy for me to deal with. So I've boiled the, the potatoes. That's good, great. And I've drained the potatoes and I went, oh, I was going to call my dad. My dad's actually in the room today. Didn't even think about this one. I thought I'd the story. So I get on the phone to my dad, and we're talking away and talking away and talking away. And Chris comes in the kitchen and goes, what are you doing? So what? I just had to call dad. He goes, what about the potatoes? I said, what about the potatoes? They're going cold. You can't mash them when they're cold. Oh, can't you? I didn't know that. He, um, yeah, great mashed potato maker as well. So then, <laughs> then Chris says, okay, I'm just going to take over. I'm going to save this. So he gets the mashed potato, well, the boiled potatoes, puts them in the microwave, let's reheat them, bring them to heat so we can mash them. Then he goes to the fridge and gets to go and get the milk and the butter because we know milk and butter makes our mashed potatoes yummy. There was only this much milk in the fridge. Good on fail, Natalie. <laughs> So, anyways, those are just two fun stories about my fails in the kitchen. Um, anyway, one of the first steps of a feast in our household is pulling all the recipe books out and going through deciding what are we going to make. Yeah, a little old school, pulling the books out and opening the books up, I know. 
But going through these books, laying out on the bench, looking at the pictures, looking at the, the recipes, and going, this is so cool. Yeah, I like that one. Like, no, I don't know. Like, oh, that's going to take too long. Or, oh, you really want to show off some skills here with this one. But the important thing is we know we have the instructions for whichever dish we choose. It's all right there. So this is going to bring me to the title of my message today. God, me, and you. Yeah, not the most grammatically correct title, I know. But it's that way for a reason, and we'll see that in a moment. So another thing I particularly love at the beginning of planning a feast is lists. And Chris will attest to this. As soon as he goes, as we say, we're going to do something, he goes, you want to write a list, don't you? Yes. I want to write everything down. I want to make sure we don't forget anything. Lists about what day we're going to do the preparation, the shopping list, the guest list, which crockery we're going to use, which baking trays. We always have to have a list, make sure everything is there. And as I said, it's just making sure that we have everything written down and we don't forget what's important. So enough about the food for the moment. We're going to have a look at the um, passage that I'm going to base my message on today, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So the first thing I want to look at here is that God is the word. It all starts with God. He inspired the scriptures. He was the one who put the thoughts and the ideas into those people who put those words onto paper or scrolls or whatever it was back then. And we now have that in our Bible. He was actually here before the world. It all comes from God. It all starts with God. And this is a truth we must understand and accept before we look at any other idea. So looking even, let's look at Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Nothing else was there. The Spirit of God was there. Nothing else mattered. The Spirit of God was there. Before anything was even formed, God was there. God has provided this word for us. and There's no other instruction manual for life. There's no better place to read about how we can love others, become more like God, know how to live our lives. Remember, our feast starts with recipe books. It's the same with our Bible. This is the recipe book God has given us for our lives. The instructions for us to follow. And the best part is God has only given us one book. Yeah, there's bits and pieces in it, but there's one book to look at. We don't have to go and look for that other recipe book. My Kitchen Rules, Master Chef. No, no, no. There's only one, and it comes from God. Sorry, what was that? Donna Hay. Oh, yes, Donna Hay, Bill Granger, all those. No, no, no. The Bible. One. That's all we have. <laughs> there was a time a little while ago where my husband and I were struggling to understand where God was calling us to be, or what God wanted us to do. We were struggling a lot financially. Uh, my husband had changed jobs and the first one didn't work out. They just weren't giving him enough shifts to make us make ends meet. Then he was offered another job in a completely different sector. And again, the projects weren't large enough. There wasn't as many projects as being promised. So we, we were struggling. We were really not sure what was going on and what God wanted us to do. I was wondering, did God want me to do more? Where do I focus my energy? You know, should I jump in and grab another couple of jobs? Is that what God was asking me to do? So remember that dinner story about the turkey. I got distracted. I forgot what the one focus was, and that was to make a nice meal for my husband while he was busy working. I got distracted. And this is what we were doing at that point in time. We were going, well, if I do this, is that going to work? If I do this, I'm looking to the left and the right. I'm being distracted, not looking to where God is. So to get the answers, the first place we know to look is the Bible. This is where I'll go to my next point, where God speaks to me. So we start with God is the center of the Bible. God is the center of that word. He brought it. And now he's going to speak to me. As we were praying and reading, there were many examples which I could share that God spoke to us through his word. Um, Luke actually mentioned a few weeks ago in one of his messages, no feast is complete without the side dishes. 
I showed you a really nice one, the chicharroni. Oh, so good. Side dishes enhance the experience and bring variety to the feast. So side dishes are usually the last thing to be planned and prepared. But in reading the Bible, our side dishes need to be one of the most important parts. Many possible side dishes which can accompany our Bible reading. And my side dish was always a guided devotional that was written to help us understand and use the Word of God in our daily lives. And at the time, it happened to be the Bible in the Year. If any one of you know that, I know quite a few people in this room do actually read that by Nikki Gumbel. It's on our um, in the Bible app. And it's wonderful because he has a selection of different um, verses, uh, passages each day, but he writes a devotional to sort of just tie it all together, um, which is really, really, really helpful. So that's what I was going through at that point in time. And um, on this particular day, I'm just praying, crying out to God, Look, I'm feeling really upset because of what's going on. And then I open up this devotional. And the first words were, Troubles do not have the last word. And the passage was Psalm 71 verse 20, which will come up on the screens. You have allowed me to suffer much hardship, but you will restore me to life again and lift me up from the depths of the earth. It was just the passage for the day but it spoke straight to our hearts. Such great encouragement that even though life is not always going to be easy, sunshine and rainbows, happy days, God is in it with us and will always help us to get through those hardships. Another one, this a second passage on this slide here, Psalm 183.3. As soon as I pray, you answer me. You encourage me by giving me strength. So this is where God was actually speaking to me through simply just reading his word and trusting that he had a reason for it. Just think back to 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16. Scripture is useful for teaching us what is true and to make us realize what was wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. I was wrong in looking sideways, being distracted. I was wrong to think that I could fix the situation and felt so discouraged that things weren't going how I wanted them to go. And here in these two passages... God was correcting me, letting me know he is the one who will make a difference. And he will give me the strength to continue through these hardships. It wasn't all on me. And remember that noodle story. Again, I thought my help in the kitchen was the answer. Of course it is. Always. I was rushing, and rushing was not the answer. I needed to wait for my husband to tell me, okay, now is the time you can boil that water and rehydrate those noodles. We need to wait for our Heavenly Father to give us that signal to boil the jug and rehydrate those noodles. It's not in our time. It's not in our strength. It is His Spirit and His timing. Two other quick passages that helped us at that time, um, James 1, 5 to 8. If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help you. You'll get his help and won't be condescended to when when you ask for it. Ask boldly, believing without a second thought. People who worry their prayers are like wind-whipped waves. Don't think you're going to get anything from the master that way. Adrift at sea, keeping all your options open. And in Psalm 27, 13 and 14, I'm sure now I'll see God's goodness is in the exuberant earth. Stay with God. Take heart. Don't quit. I'll say it again. Stay with God. Without going to the Bible regularly, who knows what knots we may have tied ourselves in. So now you can see the reason for my grammatical error in my title. We must must first start with God to learn from him before we can then be used by God when he speaks to us to help others. God was there before anything. God created the word. He speaks to me through the word when I read it. And now we'll look at how God's word allows me to help you. This is where the fun part of the story, the feast story comes. A feast isn't really a feast with just two people, is it? That's a bit boring. Oh, we do it every night. However, the two people do need to do the planning and the preparing, God and me. For me, so the fun can be in the process <clears throat> for my husband in the cooking. Or not so fun for me when I try and cook in the kitchen. Or when God uses his word to correct me and we aren't ready for that correction. So we love to invite lots of people to our feasts in our house. As I say, we love to do that. Um, And uh, there was one time we had a 
got a bunch of our friends we're talking about. Let's all get together. We haven't been in the same room together for quite a while. I think we're talking about eight to ten people sort of a thing. Uh, friends of ours in Sydney. Yep, yep. We'll do the brisket, four kilo brisket coming up. Yep, excellent. Chris goes, yes, yes, I'll do the racks of ribs, six racks of ribs or whatever it was. Yep, it's all day, you know, cooking sort of stuff happening at our house. Someone else was doing the potatoes. We got the other people. Can you bring all the cheese and the bickies, please? Yep, excellent. Cool. Everything was organised. We had the wine list set out because one of the guys is a winemaker and we have some of his wine. So we had the whole wine list set out. And um, I'll just point out that was in March 2020. We all know the perfect timing of March 2020. So, of course, we could not go ahead with this feast. We could have then just said to our friends in Sydney, go ahead and enjoy the brisket. Four kilos for two people is a lot of brisket. Plus, he didn't have the cooking implements to actually go ahead and cook it. Uh, We could have had our six racks of ribs. Again, we've been eating ribs for days. And I'm not a person who eats the same meal two days in a row. No, that doesn't work in my, my head. We could have easily all sat down, two people, and had our own feast at home with the food that we had bought and prepared. But we didn't. We waited until we could get together and enjoy that feast. Because it's not about the two of us. It's about all of us getting together. All of us sharing together. It's not for us to hold on to. And the other fun part about that story is when that time actually came when we went, yep, guys, we can all get together. We're allowed to get together. Everyone, please test. No one's got COVID. Okay, good. Excellent. We can all come to our house. We're all sitting outside. That's always good, sitting outside. And then we get a phone call from one of the guys. I've got someone staying overnight tomorrow night. Can I bring him too? Sure. Absolutely. Bring them along. And the the important part there was, let's all get together. Let's share. It's a feast. We didn't have enough chairs outside, so let's bring the dining room chairs out. Let's bring the office chairs out. We didn't have enough of this one particular beautiful crockery set. That's okay. We've got a spare one, plastic plates. Who cares? Because what is important is that we're all there together, sitting at the table, sharing. A feast is joy, fun, variety, experience, new tastes, new friends. God's Word is not for us just to hold on to. It's not just that one-person feast or a two-person feast. It's not for us to consume by ourselves, for ourselves. It's for us to share. Share as many people as possible. God's Word gives us joy, fun, variety, experience, and allows us to share new tastes and new friends. I want to share with you a quote from Craig Rochelle, wonderful um, leadership pastor. Jesus loves you and me enough to change us and use us to show others what He can do. He'll grow your faith and give you boldness, and you'll see results that will blow your mind. Refuse to be a half-hearted, lukewarm Christian. Don't hold on to that feast. Don't hold on to the cold potatoes that can't mash. Share them. Well, heat them up first. And share them. Okay, share this with everybody. Bring the feast. Jesus loves, uh, sorry, don't sit at the table by yourself. Invite others in. Share the good news with them. God did not mean for that recipe book to be for one person. God did not intend for one or two people at the feast. And God does not want the good news to be kept in one heart. Let's share that book, that recipe book with others. I want to share a quick couple of stories about where people have shared with others. Um, I have a student here at the academy um, who doesn't go to church, but she's very, very open for um, conversations about God. Um, Her husband passed a little while ago. And in the time when she was caring for him at the end of his life, she was, she was really struggling, really, really. Um, and she shared with me that she has a friend in Singleton who's a pastor. Um, and she said, I got this text message from this lady. Just out of the blue, she said, God was asking me to share this with you. And I won't go into details of what the message actually said. But this gave my student the actual strength to keep going. She knew there was a purpose in what she was doing there, caring for her husband at the end of his life. And because her friend was faithful to talk to God, her friend was faithful to read the Bible. She had these words. She had these words to share. And she knew that she she had this encouragement from God. My, my, My student knew that people were praying for her. She knew that God was there as her comforter. She didn't know Him, but she knew she cried out. She knew there was somebody there listening. Another example, a friend of mine was searching for a house for her family. Um, they, the one they had been renting um, was sold, so they had to move. But everything they looked into just could not find anything that was suitable. 
Um, and so again, I was reading my Bible one morning and this verse jumped out to me, Psalm 34, 19. To the good and godly ones, the Lord will save them and not let them be defeated by what they face. I knew straight away, it wasn't a verse for me. It was a verse for my friend. So immediately I texted her to let her know. Reading God's word helped me help her. And I can tell you just over a month after I sent that text message, she was offered a house that she could afford that her family fitted in. God was faithful because she was good and she was godly and she was praying. Another passage I sent through to that same friend, uh, 1 Peter 1, 6-7, May the thought of this cause you to jump for joy, even though lately you've had to, be put, have to put up with grief of many trials. But these only reveal the sterling core of your faith, which is far more valuable than gold, gold that perishes, for even gold is refined by fire. Your authentic faith will result in even more praise, glory and honour with Jesus, the anointed one is revealed. Thinking back to the story I was talking about with uh, the hardship, the financial hardship that my husband and I were going through. Um, the, again, this is times when people are reading the Bible, listening to God and then sharing with others. And it was actually Pastor Luke who had a prophecy for, for Chris and I. Um, and he had no idea. Luke did not know anything about this, the situation that we were going through, what we were feeling, uh, how we were struggling, trying to do it all for ourselves. But these are the words um, that that. Uh, Luke actually passed on to us. You've been following a windy path, but if you follow God's path, everything will straighten out. You'll look back and be amazed at how it has all happened. So priorities in our household changed. Uh, a lot of things changed about our focus on God. We stopped those distractions. The phone calls I have to have in the middle of that mashed potato. The rushing, boiling that jug, getting that, that water onto the We stopped all of that and we just focused on God. And I can tell you, there, there was massive breakthrough in our finances not long after that. But it's when we read that recipe book that comes from God and share it with others, we know He can speak. He can speak through us. And thinking back to our verse there, God is the Word and He and has been here from before anything else existed. When I spend time reading the Word, God encourages me, teaches me what is true makes me realize what is wrong with my life and helps me correct it. When I read the Bible, God helps me to use it to equip others and myself to do every good work. Let me encourage you, the best recipe book in the world is the Bible, God's Word. There is no better place to hear from God. So if you've not read the Bible before, or you've not, or you have, but you're not sure about who the author is, or you don't know the author, I encourage you right now, let's make the first and the best decision that you've made all day to put him first. So let's bow our heads and let's talk to this author, the author of the best book in the world, the only book in the world. Make today the day that you start to have a conversation, not just reading the words, but having a conversation with that God. Keeping your heart and mind open to see where he can help you in his word. Share it with others. Let's not make this a feast of God and me. Let's make it a feast of everyone. So today, if that's you, you're saying, I want to know this author for the first time. I want to have a relationship with him and have a conversation with him. If you just want to raise your hand just so we know who we can pray for, pray with. I'll put God first. I want to get to know the author of the best recipe book in the world. been reading that word, that, that recipe book, and you haven't yet had that revelation, I pray that you will stop and think about getting to know the author. Let's all uh, pray this prayer together as we commit our lives to knowing more, more of his word, feasting on his word and sharing his word with others. Let's pray. Jesus, this is my decision. Today I say yes to you. You died on the cross to pay the price for my sin. I invite you to be my saviour. Come into my life. Forgive my sin and fill me with the power of your Holy Spirit. 